On the afternoon of September 9, 1912, when my grandfather Jim Loft was still a boy, he hurried, as usual, to watch the Montreal train go by on the way to Buffalo, New York. The sight of a man with silver hair wearing a long robe and waving to him from the train so overwhelmed Jim that he actually fell off the fence. The man Jim saw on the train that day would change Jim's life and the life of all humanity forever. Your great, great grandfather Jim would never meet Abdul Baha in person, but Abdul Baha's life is an example for everyone and his story begins far to the east in Persia. Abdul Baha was born in Tehran. His parents, Baha'u'llah and Nawab, adored him. At his birth, he was named Abbas, meaning lion. On the very night that Abdu'l Baha was born, a youthful merchant in the city of Shiraz announced that the time had come for a spiritual reawakening in the world. The dawning of the age of peace and justice prophesied in all the world's religions. He took the name the Bab, meaning the gate in Arabic. The Bab's revolutionary call was embraced by Baha'u'llah, Nawab, and hundreds of thousands of others who were inspired by this new concept of religion as a means to establish the oneness of God, the oneness of humanity, and the oneness of religion. The Bab claimed to be preparing the way for a new messenger, one greater than himself, Many in the government and in the clergy feared losing their power over the people. They rose up intent on extinguishing the light of the new faith and, in 1850, executed the Bab. This persecution eventually saw thousands of his followers killed for their faith. Despite Baha'u'llah's noble lineage, he was thrown into the Black Pit, a foul dungeon in Tehran. Abdu'l Baha and his family lost everything. At every moment, they worried about the fate of Baha'u'llah. During this time, Abdu'l Baha's mother, Nawab, resorted to offering a handful of flour to the children when no other food could be found. Suffering under a chain so heavy that it would mark his body for the rest of his life, Baha'u'llah experienced a revelation from God. A divine summons to rise and proclaim to all on earth the dawning of a new day for all of humanity. The family wept with relief upon Baha'u'llah's release from prison, but the Shah ordered that they leave Persia forever. Abdul Baha, only nine years old, was the first in all the world to recognize that Baha'u'llah was the messenger of God for today. He would become the shield of Baha'u'llah, assuming the title Abdul Baha, meaning the servant of Baha, the servant of glory. His life is the model of how to live the teachings of Baha'u'llah. He is the exemplar. Abdul Baha spent the remainder of his childhood in exile with Baha'u'llah, 
beginning with their banishment to Baghdad in the midst of winter. His younger sister Bahia would always remember that cold and the bravery of her older brother. We were all insufficiently clothed and suffered keenly from exposure. Riding upon a horse, Abdu'l-Bahá's feet, ankles, hands, and wrists became swollen and caused him great pain. Despite his pain, Abdu'l-Bahá did all he could to ease the suffering of others, especially his father. During their 10-year exile in Baghdad, Baha'u'lláh withdrew to the mountains of Kurdistan to prepare himself for the mission with which God had entrusted him. Young Abdu'l-Bahá prayed day and night for a reunion. Two years passed before Baha'u'lláh's return. Abdu'l-Bahá's sister remembered. My father walked into the house. The meeting between my brother and his father was the most touching sight I have ever seen. Abdu'l-Bahá threw himself on the floor before him, and Baha'u'lláh wept over his boy. Abdu'l-Bahá would later recall that the taste of the dry bread and dates of those days had been sweeter than all the other food in the world. The days when from Baha'u'lláh's pen had streamed such a torrent of exalted writings night after night until dawn. Threatened by Baha'u'lláh's growing influence, the authorities again exiled the family, first to Istanbul, then to Edirne, where the first photograph of Abdu'l-Bahá was taken. Baha'u'lláh began to allude to the profound spiritual destiny and unique station of his son. The last exile was the worst of them all, the notorious prison city of Akka. Arriving under the most appalling of circumstances, Abdu'l-Bahá's sister Bahir Khanum remembered how concerned her brother was for the dignity of the women. At that time, there was no landing. It was necessary to wade ashore from the boats. The governor ordered that the women be carried on the backs of the men. Abdu'l-Bahá protested. He procured a chair, and with the help of another, he carried the women ashore. In the early days of their confinement in the citadel, several friends died. Everyone else became sick. Abdu'l-Bahá washed the patients, fed them, nursed them. He took no rest. When at length Abdu'l-Bahá had brought the rest of us through the crisis, he was utterly exhausted and fell sick himself. For two full years, Baha'u'llah, Abdu'l-Bahá, and the other exiles were confined in the citadel, the prison within the prison city's walls. Despite all this, they were in a state of inner joy, so much so that Abdu'l-Bahá would call on each of the prisoners to relate one funny thing that had happened to them during the day. They would laugh so hard that the tears would stream down their cheeks. Across the bay from Akka, the sacred mountain of Carmel had for centuries awaited the day celebrated in ancient scripture when it would see the glory of the Lord. In his later years, admiration for Baha'u'llah resulted in fewer restrictions, and he would walk on Mount Carmel with Abdu'l-Bahá, who recalled, He would time and again praise a certain spot on Mount Carmel, saying what a pleasant and agreeable place it was, and what a splendid view it offered. That ground was blessed by the footsteps of Baha'u'llah. There were a few cypress trees therein, and the blessed beauty frequently sat under their shade. He pointed out to Abdu'l-Bahá the very spot where a befitting mausoleum should be constructed to receive the remains of the Bab. 
At this point in time, Abdul Baha did not own the land, did not know the owners or builders, and did not have the finances, and the remains of the Bab were still in Persia. Abdul Baha set about the arduous task of fulfilling Baha'u'llah's instructions to him. Only a year later, in the early hours of the 29th of May, 1892, Baha'u'llah drew his last breath. Abdu'l Baha was heartbroken. For three days and nights, his grief allowed him no rest. He said, separation consumed us. The once bright days turned black as night, and all those roses of other hours were dust and rubble now. The Son of Truth, that most great light, hath set upon the horizon of the world to rise with deathless splendor over the realm of the limitless. Abdul Baha sent a courier to Akka to convey the news of Baha'u'llah's passing. Nine days after his passing, a tablet expressing Baha'u'llah's final will to the Baha'i community was read. In it, Baha'u'llah established his covenant as a means of ensuring the unity of his cause and his followers after his passing and forever beyond. He made Abdul Baha the center of that covenant. The setting of the sun of Baha'u'llah was not followed by the dark of night, but by the reflection of its glory in the moon of the covenant, lighting the path ahead towards the attainment of Baha'u'llah's ultimate purpose, the unification of humanity. Baha'u'llah likened Abdul Baha to the branch sprung forth from the tree of holiness, a branch that God had elevated so high that his benevolent shadow would encompass all of humankind. We have made thee a shelter for all mankind a shield unto all who are in heaven and on earth. God grant that through thee he may protect them, may enrich and sustain them, that he may inspire thee. Abdu'l Baha was Baha'u'llah's supreme gift to humanity, the exemplar, the perfect embodiment of his teachings. Abdu Baha said that his station was the station of servitude. His humble life of service is an inspiration for all who aspire to a fuller spiritual life. There are so many stories of individuals and communities inspired by Abdu Baha's example of how to be of service, how to overcome obstacles, and contribute to the oneness of humanity. Pilgrims from diverse parts of Persia and neighboring lands continued to travel, often on foot, hundreds of miles through treacherous lands to visit Akka. Abdul Baha greeted and tended to the pilgrims every need. He would recall their selfless acts of love and devotion to the end of his life. The flow of these believers and subsequently pilgrims from other lands deepened the bonds between Abdul Baha and his loved ones scattered across the globe. Abdul Baha was overjoyed when in 1898, the first pilgrims from the West arrived. As there was no port for a ship in Haifa, American Baha'i Lua Getzinger had to leap into a smaller boat below. One day, Abdul Baha asked Lua to care for a sick local man in the prison city 
a man he himself visited regularly. Wishing to serve as Abdul Baha did, Lua excitedly agreed. But when she arrived at the man's home, she was appalled at his condition and afraid she'd catch a terrible disease. Lua rushed back to Abdul Baha, who firmly told her that if we wish to serve God, we must serve our fellow man. Because in every person we should see the image and likeness of God. And he told her that if the house was dirty, she should clean it. If he was hungry, she should feed him. On another occasion, Abdu'l-Bahá indicated that all effort, if prompted by the desire to be of service, is prayer. Lua served the sick man as Abdu'l-Bahá had done himself so many times before. Another pilgrim, Thomas Breakwell, first heard of the Baha'i faith while in Paris in 1901, under beautifully mystical circumstances. Almost immediately, Thomas set off to meet Abdu'l-Bahá, making him the first Englishman to make the journey as a pilgrim. Pouring his heart out to Abdu'l-Bahá, Thomas expressed regret that his work benefited from child labor. Abdu'l-Bahá looked at Thomas gravely and silently, then said, cable your resignation. Thomas resigned immediately. Abdu'l-Bahá described this youth as a lamp amid the angels of high heaven. Thomas died of tuberculosis only a year later. Without having received any written word, Abdu'l-Bahá knew of Thomas's passing and with streaming tears revealed a tablet. O oh Breakwell, O oh my dear one, at all times do I call thee to mind. I shall never forget thee. With love and appreciation for Abdu'l-Bahá growing throughout the region, and although he was still a prisoner, Abdu'l-Bahá was permitted to travel to nearby Adisiya, where Baha'u'llah had instructed him to buy land. Although fertile, the land in Adisiya was wild and uncultivated. Abdu'l-Bahá helped the farmers diversify their crops, and their farms prospered. He encouraged the farmers to look at their situation in a new way. When they were threatened by bandits, he urged the farmers to befriend them. Economics must commence with the farmer, Abdu'l-Bahá stated, for the farmer is the first active agent in human society. He instructed the farmers to profit share, building a community based on trust and generosity. These farmers became known and respected for their kindness, diligence, and ingenuity. The hard work of a few people striving to make sound moral decisions based on the teachings of Baha'u'llah transformed the region. Years later, the grain grown in Adasiya would save thousands of lives. From early morning until late at night, Abdu'l-Bahá offered profound guidance on a wide range of subjects concerning the spiritual and material advancement of civilization. He encouraged fledgling communities and lovingly guided people in hundreds of localities in the East and in the West. The councils sent to individuals, including a believer named Mustafa Rumi, whose love for Abdu'l-Bahá knew no bounds, led to the flourishing of some of the earliest Baha'i communities in Burma, India, Singapore, Indonesia, and Malaysia. In one Burmese village called Dedanao, Mustafa Rumi's simple act of kindness towards a stranger attracted 800 people to the Baha'i faith. Soon, a new pattern of community life emerged. When the community built its first school in Dedanao, they called it the School of Abdu'l-Bahá. And thereafter, Abdu'l-Bahá lovingly referred to Dedanao as my village. 
An increasing number of pilgrims from the East visited Abdul Baha in the Holy Land, returning home filled with inspiration and insight about how to best serve their communities. Abdul Baha likened these pilgrims to living letters that he was sending out to share enlightenment. Together with his writings, his guidance flowed to all parts of Persia and neighboring lands. Although permanently exiled, Abdul Baha's love and concern for his homeland was evident to the very end of his life. Through his constant counsel and encouragement, the Baha'i community in Persia advanced in many areas ranging from agriculture to health to literacy, all for the benefit of everyone in society. As a young man, Abdul Baha had been tasked by Baha'u'llah to write a major treatise addressed anonymously to the rulers and people of Persia, outlining an approach to modernity consistent with the true purpose of religion, based on spiritual principles necessary to reconstruct a just, prosperous and unified society, principles which the Baha'is in Persia endeavoured to apply. Abdu'l Baha encouraged the Persian Baha'i community to establish its own schools, and the Tarbiat Boys School in Tehran was soon founded. This school was also the forerunner of several other Baha'i schools in various parts of Persia, including schools for girls. Abdu'l Baha guided many friends, prominent amongst whom was Mirza Hassane Adib, in the development of these prestigious institutions which were considered the forefront of educational development for an extended period. Abdul Baha's guidance impacted the education and upliftment of future generations of women throughout Persia and now throughout the world. Stressing the importance of education, he wrote, The primary, the most urgent requirement is the promotion of education. It is inconceivable that any nation should achieve prosperity and success unless this fundamental concern is carried forward. On another occasion, he said, most important of all is the education of girl children, for these girls will one day be mothers, and the mother is the first teacher of the child. Abdul Baha had previously arranged for the remains of the Bab martyred nearly 50 years earlier to be brought to the Holy Land, as Baha'u'llah had instructed him. Abdul Baha personally oversaw the construction of the mausoleum in which the remains of the Blessed Bab would ultimately be laid to rest. At one point, he stated, every stone of that building, every stone of the road leading to it, I have with infinite tears raised and placed in position. In truth, my heart is filled with such great joy and gladness as cannot be described. The Burmese community lovingly carved the Bab sarcophagus from a single block of marble, naturally embedded with small rubies and prepared for its transport to the Holy Land. When Abdul Baha met with a group of pilgrims from the West, he noticed that one member of that group was missing. Walking to the doorway, he found Robert Turner waiting outside. As soon as he saw Abdul Baha, Robert fell to his knees. Abdul Baha raised Robert to his feet and embraced him. Robert Turner the first African-American Baha'i had been born into slavery and was now a free man. He had written to Abdul Baha years earlier and included a photograph of himself. Abdul Baha replied, O thou who art pure in heart, sanctified in spirit, peerless in character, 
beauteous in face. Thou art like unto the pupil of the eye, which is dark in color, yet it is the fount of light and the revealer of the contingent world. Abdul Baha's acute awareness of the racial crisis in America caused him great anguish. For oneness is the pivot around which all of Baha'u'llah's teachings revolve. Baha'u'llah outlawed slavery in the clearest terms, saying, it is not for him who is himself a servant to buy another of God's servants. Abdul Baha told Robert that by remaining firm and steadfast in his faith, he would be the door through whom a whole race would enter the kingdom. Every day, Abdul Baha would greet those in need, distributing coins and clothes with compassion. Little children gathered around him to receive sweets and his infinite words of support and kindness. And in Abdul Baha's household was a special gift, his grandson Shogi. At just five years old, Shoghi Effendi pleaded with his grandfather to write something for him. Oh, my Shoghi, you said write. I have written. Now is not the time for you to read and write. It is the time for jumping about and chanting, Oh, my God. Therefore, memorize the prayers of the Blessed Beauty and chant them that I may hear them. The little boy obediently set himself to memorize a number of Baha'u'llah's prayers and chanted them so loudly that his parents begged him to stop. He said, Abdul Baha wrote to me to chant that he may hear me. I am doing my best. Abdul Baha would later entrust Shoghi Effendi to carry forward the covenant of Baha'u'llah, ensuring that the divine order for the unification of the human race and the administration of its affairs would be safeguarded. In Persia, Baha'is were still harshly persecuted, and many re-established themselves in Ishkabad in Turkmenistan, from where the faith would spread to numerous cities and towns in Central Asia and Russia. In 1902, guided by Abdul Baha and fulfilling the wish of Baha'u'llah, the Baha'is in Ishkabad established the first Baha'i house of worship in the world. Abdul Baha encouraged every stage of this temple's development, personally supervised by the Vakilu Dawleh Afnan, a cousin of the Bab. The community established dependencies around the temple, including a school, hospital, and university. With Abdul Baha's guidance, the community flourished. Parallel to this development, Abdul Baha lovingly nurtured the growing Baha'i communities throughout the Caucasus, which received a constant flow of correspondence from him about their ongoing development and contribution to the life of society. Inspired by the House of Worship in Ishkabad, the Baha'is of North America wrote for permission to build a temple in the West. Abdul Baha asked Corinne True, a busy mother who had come to visit him, to take charge. When three prominent men from Chicago arrived a few days later, Abdul Baha told them to work with Corinne, saying, I have given her complete instructions. Abdul Baha had entrusted a woman with the community's defining enterprise. Corinne instigated the Baha'i Temple Unity, which Abdul Baha insisted must include women. The formation of this committee eventually led to the establishment of the first National Spiritual Assembly of the United States and Canada. With Abdul Baha's guidance, Corinne undertook the task of building the Mother Temple of the West. Stressing the importance of the equality of women and men, Abdul Baha wrote, Women will become the peers of men, and until this equality is established, true progress and attainment for the human race will not be facilitated. Abdul Baha had entered the prison city of Akka, a young man of 24. He had survived horrendous hardships, 
the lies and rumour-mongering of his detractors, and threats to his life. In 1908, all political and religious prisoners throughout the Ottoman Empire were released. Now, after 50 years as an exile and prisoner, Abdul Baha was free, with the Shrine for the Bab now standing on the very spot designated years before. Abdul Baha fulfilled that sacred task of interring the remains of the Bab on Mount Carmel, a major accomplishment of Abdul Baha's ministry carried out at the instruction of Baha'u'llah. The marble sarcophagus was transported with great labor to the vault, and in the evening, by the light of a single lamp, he laid within it, with his own hands, the wooden casket containing the sacred remains of the Bab. Shoghi Effendi, just 13 at the time, later in his life described that scene saying, Abdul Baha cast aside his turban, removed his shoes and his cloak, bent low over the still open sarcophagus, his silver hair waving about his head, and his face transfigured and luminous, rested his forehead on the border of the wooden casket, and sobbing aloud wept with such a weeping that all those who were present wept with him. Shoghi Effendi referred to the unimaginable potencies of the Shrine of the Bab and its immense spiritual impact on the unfoldment of the world administrative center of the faith of Baha'u'llah, now established on Mount Carmel. By Abdul Baha's side, these many long years had been his wife, Munir -e Khanu. Baha'u'llah himself had blessed their union nearly 40 years earlier, when Abdul Baha was still a young man in Akka. It is impossible to put into words the delight of being with Abdul Baha, with his unfailing love, his kindness, his cheerfulness, his sense of humor, his untiring consideration for everybody. He was marvelous, without equal surely on all the earth. For 50 years, my beloved and I were together. Never were we separated, save during his visits to Egypt, Europe, and America. Advanced in age, yet still remarkably vigorous, Abdul Baha quietly and without ceremony boarded a ship, undertaking a three-year journey to announce to the world that the long-promised age for the unification of humanity had come. In his absence, Abdul Baha entrusted his beloved sister, Bahir Khanu, to hold the reins of the Baha'i faith, a role unprecedented for women in religious history. In Egypt, scholars, clerics, and newspaper reporters welcomed Abdul Baha with enthusiasm and curiosity. Sheikh Ali Yusuf, the editor of the Arabic paper Al Muwayyad, who was once harshly opposed to the Baha'is, visited Abdul Baha, then described his encounter. He is deeply versed in theology, master of the history of Islam. Dedicated to the belief in the oneness of mankind, his teaching and guidance revolve around the axes of relinquishing prejudices, religious, racial, patriotic. A young boy named Ali Yazdi remembered his first meeting with Abdul Baha in Egypt. He was as straight as an arrow. He looked at everyone, smiled, and welcomed all with Khoshamadid, Khoshamadid. Welcome, welcome. When Abdul Baha spoke to me, I would look into his eyes, blue, smiling, and full of love. In his life, in his deeds, in his written and spoken words, Abdu'l-Bahá challenged the fundamental assumptions of society. 
constantly guiding humanity towards unity, so that ignorance, poverty, and violence would be banished from the earth. Abdul Baha traveled to Europe, where in London's city temple, he spoke to an overflowing congregation. His first address before an audience of more than just a fortunate few, saying, This is a new cycle of human power. All the horizons of the world are luminous. You are loosed from ancient superstitions which have kept men ignorant, destroying the foundation of true humanity. The gift of God to this enlightened age is the knowledge of the oneness of mankind. In Europe, Abdul Baha would eventually visit Switzerland, Scotland, Germany, Hungary, and France, where he spoke to thousands about the search for truth, saying, All consider themselves respectively the only guardians of the truth, and that every other religion is composed of errors. The fact that we imagine ourselves to be right and everybody else wrong is the greatest of all obstacles in the path towards unity. And unity is necessary if we would reach truth, for truth is one. Across the Atlantic in New York City, a Christian clergyman named Howard Colby Ives was struggling with faith and purpose. That fall and winter is a period marked in my memory as months of great unhappiness. I know of no greater disappointment than that which comes to the sincere soul who, seeking God, finds him not. When Howard learned that Abdul Baha was coming to America, he told a friend that he would like to meet him alone to discern the truth. Weeks later, Howard's wish came true. We sat alone, knee to knee, eye to eye. He looked at me. He looked right into me. It seemed as though never before had anyone really seen me. He put his two thumbs to my eyes while he wiped the tears from my face, admonishing me not to cry. That one must always be happy. And he laughed, such a ringing boyish laugh. We both sat perfectly silent for what seemed a long while, and gradually a great peace came to me. Then he swept me into his arms. Such a hug, my very ribs cracked. He kissed me on both cheeks, laid his arm across my shoulders, and led me to the door. That is all. But life has never been quite the same since. During the days the two spent together, Abdul Baha often spoke of Christ with this minister. Howard became a devoted Baha'i. He later wrote, Here, 2,000 years from the dawn of Christian teaching stood one whose life and word were the very embodiment of the essence of the message of goodwill to all peoples. In his writings and during his travels, Abdul Baha tirelessly proclaimed essential spiritual truths to leaders of thought. He engaged with countless groups and individuals in the scientific, economic, and social justice communities, including the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Despite the acclaim given to him, Abdul Baha always made clear that Baha'u'llah was the source of his thought and action. Early on in his travels, Abdu'l-Bahá had met Louis Gregory, 
an African-American lawyer who had recently recognized Baha'u'llah. Abdul Baha left a profound impression on him. To one who realizes even faintly who this servant of God is and what powers he represents, such a meeting is high above all the honors of earth. Abdul Baha introduced Lewis to another new Baha'i, an independent young British woman named Louisa Matthew. This introduction turned out to be providential. At Lewis's invitation, Abdul Baha spoke before 1,600 students, faculty, and guests gathered at Howard University in Washington, D.C. The overflowing crowd that afternoon was the first of many predominantly black audiences Abdul Baha would address in America. Later, at a formal luncheon, Lewis was excluded from attending due to the color of his skin. Where is Mr. Gregory? Abdul Baha asked. Bring Mr. Gregory. Abdul Baha had utensils, plates, and glasses pushed aside to seat Lewis beside him. Abdul Baha then sat down, and as if nothing out of the ordinary had occurred, began to speak on justice. We all know and admit that justice is good, but there is a need of volition and action to carry out and manifest it. In September 1912, Lewis Gregory and Louisa Matthew were wed. Abdul Baha encouraged and rejoiced in their union. He wrote, Diversity in the human family should be the cause of love and harmony, as it is in music, where many different notes blend together in the making of a perfect chord. When Abdul Baha arrived in Chicago to dedicate the temple site, he found Corinne True heartbroken. Only the night before, her son Davis had died, one of five children that Corinne and her husband had lost. Before the dedication, on a bridge nearby, Abdul Baha consoled her. He understood her grief. He too had lost five children. Abdul Baha assured those assembled that the temple is already built. He conveyed that the house of worship was an instrument to unite all humankind. Abdul Baha tenderly called Corinne the mother of the temple. The community diligently sacrificed and constructed this temple over 40 years. Corinne attended the opening with her daughters. She was 92. In Montreal, Abdul Baha was the guest of May and Sutherland Maxwell. Here he offered many talks on a wide range of subjects. Of the arts, Abdul Baha said, in this wonderful new age, art is worship. The more thou strivest to perfect it, the closer wilt thou come to God. Sutherland, an esteemed architect and artist, would later design the superstructure of the Shrine of the Bab. Abdul Baha's magnetism was irresistible to May and Sutherland's little two-year-old daughter, Mary, and he in turn adored her. Recalling a tender moment, Abdul Baha wrote, Today I was resting, and the door opened. The little girl came in and pushed my eyelids up with her small finger and said, We get them, Abdul Baha. Young Mary Maxwell would later marry Abdul Baha's grandson, Shoghi Effendi. This marriage was a symbol of the unity of East and West. Following Abdul Baha's example, she traveled widely to encourage and serve others, especially those in far flung and remote places. <laughs> oh, 
As Abdul Baha's train left Montreal, he saw little Jim Loft perched on his fence. Even as a child, Jim believed in equality and felt a strong pull to spirituality, but he didn't know where to look. Jim suffered years of prejudice, hardship, and loss. And then he saw Abdul Baha again, this time in a photograph. His world was transformed, his eyes were opened. He and his wife Melba became the first Indigenous Baha'is in Canada. Having raised the warning and urged the world to work for peace, Abdul Baha returned to the Holy Land in 1913, and the first world war he had predicted broke out. This violence and injustice filled Abdul Baha's soul with agony. He explained that patriotic prejudice is also due to absolute ignorance, for the surface of the earth is one native land. When a wartime blockade threatened the region, the grain Abdul Baha had asked the farmers of Adesia to grow and store was carried by camel to Akka and Haifa. Abdul Baha's actions and foresight saved countless local people from all backgrounds from starvation. When asked, Abdul Baha told reporters that peace was his purpose and his message. Writing to the Central Organization for a Durable Peace at The Hague, Abdul Baha emphasized that peace would require a profound transformation in human consciousness and a commitment to spiritual truths, demonstrating that any barrier to peace can be obliterated through Baha'u'llah's teachings. Referring to a root cause of prejudice and division, Abdul Baha explained, if religion does not agree with science, it is superstition and ignorance. For God has endowed man with reason in order that he may perceive reality. During the war, Abdul Baha had suffered from ill health and exhaustion and was virtually severed from all communication with the growing community. During this time, he penned a series of 14 messages to North America, the tablets of the divine plan. Although sent by simple postcards due to the requirement of wartime, these tablets called for the spiritual regeneration of the world. Abdul Baha asked the young Baha'i community to arise and take action, saying, Oh, that I could travel to these regions and raising the call in cities, villages, mountains, deserts, and oceans, promote the divine teachings. This, alas, I cannot do. How intensely I deplore it. Please, God, ye may achieve it. Abdul Baha had met Martha Root, a colorful young journalist, during his journeys in 1912, when she had shared with him that she was ill with cancer. Laying her head on his shoulder, he encouraged her. Roar out the call of the divine kingdom. Thou shalt witness great results and extraordinary confirmations. Responding to Abdul Baha's call to action, Martha arose immediately. In the smallest villages and the grandest palaces, Martha approached every door with what she considered the most priceless gem the world had ever received, the message of Baha'u'llah. She would, during the remainder of her life, circle the globe four times. Although a few believers did immediately and heroically respond to the call of Abdul Baha in the tablets of the divine plan, bringing the faith to such far off shores as Australia, Brazil, China, and South Africa, the efforts to take the light of the teachings to every part of the globe only gradually gained momentum. Through plans later devised by Shoghi Effendi and, since its establishment, by the Universal House of Justice, Abdul Baha's vision to take the cause of God to every continent, every region, every country, every people, every town and hamlet has been systematically implemented. 
Over the decades, it has inspired deeds of heroism and love by countless souls, young and old, beyond what sometimes seemed humanly possible. Abdu'l-Bahá wrote, Baha'u'lláh has drawn the circle of unity. He has made a design for the uniting of all the peoples. He says now the new age is here and creation is reborn. Humanity hath taken on new life. All things are now made new. And all this newness hath its source in the fresh outpourings of wondrous grace and favor from the Lord of the kingdom which have renewed the world. The people, therefore, must be set completely free from their old patterns of thought, that all their attention may be focused upon these new principles, for these are the light of this time and the very spirit of this age. They are us and we are them. Abdu'l-Bahá nurtured capacities in each and all to realize our oneness these are the fruits of his example. Abdu'l-Bahá emphasized that with pure intention and selfless motives, a longing to serve humanity, and with sacrifice and wholehearted effort, people everywhere can unite to contribute to the spiritual transformation and regeneration of the world. One hundred years after his passing, Abdu'l-Bahá reassures humanity, saying, Remember, whether or not I be on earth, my presence will be with you always. At all times do I speak of you and call you to mind, and with tears I implore him to rain down all these blessings upon you and gladden your hearts and make blissful your souls and grant you exceeding joy. <laughs> <laughs>